Good evening, and welcome to the fifth of a series of six forums um, sponsored by the Rhode Island Foundation and WRNI, Rhode Island's Public Radio. Is this still on? Okay. Um, these forums are really an opportunity for our community, the community of Rhode Island, to come together, engage in discussion and debate about the issues that we care about in the state. Um, I'm Jenny Pereira. I'm from the Rhode Island Foundation. Um, and on behalf of WRNI, the Rhode Island Foundation, and the Knight Foundation, which provided a grant, a community information challenge grant um, for these forums, I want to say thank you to the University of Rhode Island um, for hosting this evening. Um, and also a special welcome to Block Island. Are they on? <laughs> OK. A lot of effort went into trying to link into Block Island, so to really create more access to this event across the state. And we want to thank URI, um, the town clerk of New Shoreham, Molly Fitzpatrick, and the Public Utilities Commission that helped to make that happen. Um, and it will happen. Um, <laughs> the Rhode Island Foundation supports organizations, programs, ideas, discourse um, on the issues that um, we care about in the state. In the area of the environment, our efforts include support of energy conservation and renewable energy initiatives because um, we recognize that the resilience of our environment and our economy are intrinsically linked to energy. How we extract it, how we use it, um, is really important for us to talk about. So tonight we have a knowledgeable panel that can help guide this conversation on a very complex issue, offshore wind. Um, I hope that all of us will use tonight as a springboard. Um, after tonight, go out, seek out other resources, expertise, information, and continue the conversation. Um, log on to the website, uh, ricommunityforums.org, and um, add your comments and questions and continue the conversation after this evening. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging in this discussion, and I look forward to, to participating. This is Rhode Island Public Radio Community Forum focused on the future of offshore wind energy in Rhode Island. I'm Rhode Island Public Radio News Director Catherine Welch. We're looking at the impacts offshore wind energy will have on the environment, energy cost, and the state's economy. We're starting with the environmental impacts, and our panelists for that discussion are Mr. Grover Fugate. He's not only the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council, but also the Project Manager of the Rhode Island Special Area management plan, best known as the Ocean Sam. Hello, Grover. Hi. We have Jonathan Stone, the executive director of Save the Bay, an organization centered on restoring and improving the health of the Narragansett Bay and adjacent coastal waters. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. And we have Jeff Grabowski, Chief Administrative Officer and Senior Vice President for Strategy and External Affairs for Deepwater Wind, the developer of the first offshore wind farm off Block Island. Jeff, welcome. Hello, thank you. So what seems to be a clean energy environmental slam dunk gets complicated really quickly when you are talking about offshore wind energy. There are environmental impacts of sticking turbines into the ocean floor. So I'd like to start off with uh, Grover Fugate. Um, we're going to start very simply. You are the project manager of the Ocean SAMP, so you are the most qualified to explain in 30 seconds or less, what is a SAMP? A SAMP is a uh, tool that actually comes out of the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act. It allows states to look at special areas or special circumstances uh, to go in there, and uh, the SAMPs are intended, uh, as the statute outlines, to balance both economic and environmental interests uh, and to provide for a greater uh, level of uh, intensity of, of looking at those issues and trying to come up with uh, more specific guidelines for development uh, to uh, deal with the issues that are identified. In the Ocean SAMP area, what we were at tasked to look at was to see if there were any areas uh, within uh, an area of consideration, and we chose 30 miles. Uh, and at the time, uh, that was driven off the technology that was present. Um, 
20 miles is typically the limit of transmission for AC transmission, which is the dominant transmission that you see in wind farms in Europe. Uh, we chose a buffer off of that of about 10 miles. So that formed about a 30 mile cord along the coast. Uh, and then we went out and had a look to see if there were any areas that could support potentially wind farm development at two scales, uh, both a small scale uh, within state waters and also a larger scale within federal waters. In order to do that, we needed to partner with the federal government uh, because there are federal regulatory entities that obviously come into play when we discuss this. And so we had to deal with uh, the Army Corps within state waters, and we had to deal with uh, BOMER, or the old MMS at the time, Mineral Management yes. Service, for the uh, Department of Interior. Uh, and they are on the federal side in uh, federal waters. I, I, during my research, have thought of the ocean SAMP as sort of zoning regulations for a, a certain area of water off the coast of Rhode Island, sort of a 3D zoning. You looked at what was flying up in the sky. You looked at the little critters living on the ocean floor. Is that fair metaphor, a kind well, of zoning? Yeah, I think or? certainly the consideration of the environment was in 3D. Um, and then not only the environment itself, but the other users that are out there. All that was done in, th in a sort of a three-dimensional capacity. Uh, the SAMP itself uh, was looking at, again, area identification and also to look at resources that may be potentially protected or need to be protected uh, f in terms of major ocean development, not just wind farm development, but there are many other major ocean projects that could occur within this area that we needed to potentially look at and consider and uh, put policies in place to ensure the protection of the existing resources. All right. Uh, Deepwater Winds, Jeff Grabowski, your company looks at the SAMP on designated waters, this, air, this sort of document looking at designated waters for wind farms. Where, what do you do with the ocean SAMP? Where does that come into play for your organization? Well, the ocean, the ocean SAMP is a critical tool for us. Um, it is the baseline upon which we build the rest of our permitting regime. So uh, Rhode Island is uniquely situated in the nation to develop a very near-term wind farm, offshore wind farm, because the state has already invested for many years in uh, collecting the baseline data that's critical to understand where an offshore wind farm can be located. So. Everything we do with respect to the Block Island wind farm uh, in the permitting process and, and the eventual construction has as its baseline the information, the data, and the stakeholder input that uh, the SAMP process collected. So before you decide where you're going to put the turbines, you know the major shipping channels. You know where the right whales come in. You know where certain birds migrate up in the sky. It sort of gives you a framework of activity. Uh, absolutely. It was a critical uh, data collection effort, data analysis ac effort. But also, and, and this, this is a critical piece and something that Grover and his team worked um, very hard at over the years, it's, it was a stakeholder process as well. So we were also able to take into consideration, as the CRMC did, input of various stakeholders. So you're right. We have a much better information today about the best place to send an offshore wind farm than we, than we did four years ago. You know where the, the fishermen like to go get their catches, where some of the hot spots are as well that you need, you'll need to work with. It's a, that's a critical piece of information that we have from the SAMP. That's right. Jonathan Stone of Save the Bay, the plan looks at just about everything as we've talked about. Um, what is the biggest environmental impact that Save the Bay is going to keep an eye on as um, this first project of five turbines moves forward? Well, let me let me begin by saying that the um, the the product one of the products of the Ocean SAMP was providing um, data on valuable habitats for various species that inhabit both state waters and federal waters, and that uh, again baseline data is um, very helpful to all of us in the environmental community to specifically identify areas of particular and special environmental value. Uh, as either habitat um, uh, in this three-dimensional space you men mentioned, whether it be uh, above water in the water column or along the bottom, uh, and particularly bottom structures that exist. And um, the SAMP uh, and the research done by the University of Rhode Island and others identified particular areas of value uh, for various species, be they fish, birds, uh, mammals, and those areas are um, 
uh, I, knowing where those areas exist is extraordinarily helpful to us and other environmental organizations and the state and the developer to um, understand better where we can avoid and if not avoid, then minimize uh, adverse environmental impacts. All right, and, and maybe this is a question for Grover as well. Um, were, did, were hot spots discovered, these very uh, precious environmental spots within the SAMP? Were they known or were they discovered through this process? Well, the actual location uh, was documented during the, the, the SAMP process. We know that uh, because the structure that is present within what are called terminal moraines. These are essentially large boulder fields that are left over after the last uh, deglaciation of this area. That those areas offer a lot of structure, which means biodiversity, which means valuable habitat. The SAMP identified those areas and has policies in place now, as Jonathan indicated, uh, protecting those areas, uh, requiring any developer of any type of major ocean development to avoid those areas. Uh, even where we've identified them within the wind energy areas, they still have to avoid those with their tower placements. So uh, we've, we're able to, to document and protect those areas through this process. You're listening to a special forum called The Future of Offshore Wind Energy in Rhode Island. We're talking about the environmental impacts with Executive Director of the CRMC, Grover Fugate, Deepwater Wind Senior Vice President Jeff Grabowski, and Save the Bay Executive Director Jonathan Stone. So right whales, for those who may not know, um, the right whale was nearly hunted to extinction. There are about 350 left. Um, I sort of think of them as honorary Rhode Islanders in that they spend their summer off of Cape Cod and Block Island, and they eat, and they have a great time. And then and down in the winter, they head down to Florida. So um, I don't know if they have their cars registered there, but uh, that's sort of the migration process of the right whale. And um, a few summers ago, there was about a third of the right whales located off of Block Island. and, and Jeff, um, one of the things the Conservation Law Foundation is worried about is the use of sonar surveying and its interaction with the right whale. Deepwater started this week. Three vessels are um, surveying to create a map of where the cables should go for this first uh, project. Um, what are you doing to mitigate the impact of um, sonars on the right whales? Actually, our, our survey protocol was uh, interrupted by Irene. She had something to say about uh, our sending vessels out onto the ocean uh, very recently. But we'll be starting, uh, probably around another seven days or so, uh, a series of surveys on the ocean uh, in the area of the wind farm and also in the area of the cable connecting Block Island to the mainland. Um, and we will be using a variety of techniques, including some sonar techniques, to uh, essentially create a 3D map of the ocean floor and the near, the near surface, the sub-bottom, uh, probably a few meters deep. Uh, and that'll be the location of the cable and the wind farm. But you're right, right whales are, are, are the critical species in this area for the Block Island wind farm. Uh, and their migratory patterns are very important to us. Uh, we will uh, be conducting the surveys and the use of sonar according not only to industry standards, but according to standards that have been promulgated by several federal agencies. So Department of Interior's BOEMRE has a variety of permitting and surveying uh, protocols I, that I, include I, things like separation zones. So we have to have folks uh, actually stationed on the ships that are marine mammal monitors. And their job is to monitor, monitor the area of activity. And if we see uh, a right whale, activity stops. And so there are, there are certain zones around each vessel in the use of sonar to make sure that the sonar doesn't in any way disturb uh, a marine mammal, mammal, including right whales. And there's something called a bubble curtain, which sounds very sci-fi, where you create this big bubble in the yeah, ocean. Yeah, the, the bubble curtain is, is uh, traditionally used during the construction phase when there is uh, pile driving. So when you use an, uh, an underwater pile driver that creates a lot of acoustic activity, uh, and one way to mitigate that activity is to create this, this bubble. Um, we, we probably are going to go into a construction uh, scenario where we don't, don't do any underground pile driving, underwater pile driving, where the pile driving will be above water so that the piles actually go through the top of the structure. And that greatly mitigates the acoustic impacts on marine mammals. 
So Grover, as deep water wind starts mapping the area of the SAMP using sonar techniques amongst many, what does the state do to make sure that the least amount of harm is being done to right whales? Well, as Jeff has indicated, um, right whales fall into the jurisdiction of the federal government. Uh, there are several federal statutes that end up protecting uh, those species. The uh, guidance that Jeff is talking about, the geotechnical and geophysical guidance that's been given out by uh, BOMER is the uh, guidance that's been worked out with National Marine Fishery Service uh, and under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and also the Endangered Species Act. Uh, so that guidance is intended to be protective of those species uh, and those entities that are responsible for monitoring and ensure compliance with the, uh, those permits. The federal government unfortunately supersedes us in that area because of the, uh, the law. So. Grover, can we uh, talk real briefly about um, their, their deep water wind is mapping this area. They want to run the cables from the turbines to both Block Island and the mainland. And, and there's an electromagnetic field that, that gets emanated sometimes from these cables. And there's real concern through research on the impact of these electromagnetic fields on sharks and rays and sea turtles. Uh, wh wh what will the state be looking at to make sure that some of those effects are mitigated? And where does Save the Bay then? I'd like you to come in. What are some of your concerns with that? There are several things that can be done to try to deal with it. Obviously, the cable placement itself is key in terms of trying to mitigate those impacts initially. Um, the other thing is, is the depth of burial of the cable uh, also helps mitigate some of those impacts. And the actual construction techniques within the cable itself can also be used to mitigate the electromagnetic fields. All the research that's been done up to this point in time in Europe indicates that yes, we know that rays and skates tend to be attracted to these areas uh, because they use uh, electromagnetic fields in their uh, hunting behavior uh, and they use it to detect prey. Uh, but in this um, situation, there has been no demonstrated impacts that have been shown anywhere in terms of either population or even individual level impacts. But we are going to, with the federal government, work on monitoring standards to again look at this and we need to study it more. I mean, it's we uh, obviously don't know everything about this this particular area. And Jonathan, real quickly, your, the Save the Bay's concerns on these? Well, one thing I want to mention is that um, it's important to note that the, a specific detailed proposal has not been put forward by deep water. We're talking conceptually about the wind farm in Block Island waters and in federal waters. And we would look very carefully at the studies that uh, a proposal would, that would accompany a proposal on issues like the electromagnetic field. So um, it's the ocean SAMP, it's important to note, the ocean SAMP does not replace um, uh, in a, a federally mandated environmental impact study uh, required under NEPA, and it does not replace certain studies that the state may uh, require of deep water. Or em environmental impact I want to get to quickly while we still have time, and that's um, there are these super rich ecosystems, I think they're called glacial management areas, these hot spots where there's, they're just rich, they're rocky and rich with uh, wildlife and habitat. And um, Jonathan, if deep water needs a turbine to go up in one of these areas, uh, as Save the Bay, I mean, there's this push and pull, it's clean energy, but at the same time there may be some environmental impacts. How does your organization wrestle with these very real issues? Well, let me, let me start. It's, it, you're, getting, uh, you're really cutting to the chase of the major challenge that we all face as a society and as a state in that all forms of energy that we use to augment our own human energy has environmental impacts. And it's critical to remember that as we evaluate wind and renewable energy sources, be they wind or solar or hydro, um, hydroelectric, electric, the costs and benefits of each technology need to be compared with the true costs of fossil fuel-based energy. That's very important to remember because um, uh, the uh, economists like to call it externalities. Costs that have a significant impact on human life, human health, are not borne by the oil and gas industry. They're borne by us, but they're not borne by the industry that it develops uh, uh, fossil fuel-based energy resources. So it's very important as you consider the back up and look at um, the costs and benefits of renewable resources that you consider those. Um, 
clearly we understand as an environmental organization that renewable energy is critical to our future critical to Rhode Island's future and critical to the, uh, the, the country's future. And um, we understand, and as a matter of policy, actively advocate for renewable energy development. Um, we think it's important that we all appreciate these trade-offs. Um, in the case of offshore, uh, of, of offshore um, energy development and wind energy development, we think there are ways, as evidenced by the work done through the SAMP process, that there are ways to minimize those adverse environmental impacts and still retain the uh, ecological benefits of renewable energy. And Jeff Grabowski, does Deepwater Wind, real quickly, have a sense of the environmentally sensitive areas and Yes, we do, and, and that's, the, that's the benefit of the SAMP, and that's the benefit of the, of the fact that the SAMP has identified certain areas as suitable. I want to echo what Jonathan said. Let's not forget, with the Block Island Wind Farm, we'll be replacing probably the dirtiest form of fuel generation out there, diesel generators that are currently on the island. So when we're talking about environmental uh, impact, let's not lose the forest for the trees here. We will be talking about uh, the impact on energy costs. You're listening to a special forum called The Future of Offshore Wind Energy in Rhode Island. We've been talking about the environmental impacts of offshore wind energy wind farms with uh, CRMC Executive Director Grover Fugate. Thank you, Grover. With uh, Save the Bay Director Jonathan Stone. Thank you. Thank you. And Deepwater Wind Senior Vice President Jeff Grabowski, who will be sticking around for our next segment, looking into the impacts on energy costs. Thanks, Catherine. This forum is produced by, the Rhode, I by Rhode Island Public Radio in collaboration with the Rhode Island Foundation and is underwritten by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Thank you.